Hello, welcome back to the Out of Spec podcast. It's been a little while. Um, we were in Germany for quite some time. And you'll notice I'm not joined by Kyle this time. I am joined by our friend Uli, Uli Heckman, who actually we met back at our Out of Spec. Um, I don't remember what we called it, but our event in Pasadena last fall, where we had a bunch of journalists and enthusiasts out to Pasadena to basically drive a bunch of EVs, electric cars. And Uli is an EV enthusiast, I think you would say, um, but also just a car enthusiast. And um, <clears throat> we quickly bonded over many things, obviously. I'd say love of good food, love of photography, design. There's a lot I mean, there's infinite things we could talk about, could go for hours, but I wanted to have Uli on at least for an initial conversation, kind of an introduction, and maybe have him on some future episodes as well if we want to do more topical-based things, because it's cool to have people on with different backgrounds and interests and uh, specializations. So Uli, thank you for joining. <laughs> Pleasure. Thanks for having me. And you are, I guess, here from, uh, you're tuning in from Munich, that's right. So Yeah, I'm in my office here in Munich, in the middle yeah. of Schwabing, nice. so that's <laughs> where the action goes down, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I guess to kind of start off a bit, um, can you tell me a little bit about your background and like... It's, I'm such, it's such a varied background, I'm sure, but I know you've studied some design and you mentioned that even that's even a family lineage. I mean, your your father yeah. had an eye for design yeah, as well. Yeah, sure. So um, first of all, let's, let's go way back. I come from Stuttgart. So this is why I land here in the end. It all makes sense. It's a, how you call it, the full circle. Yeah. So I grew up in Stuttgart. My dad is an architect. My mom is a music teacher. So classical late 68 political agenda and I uh, had a really nice upbringing in Stuttgart, only child. And uh, after school, I didn't know what to do. Right? So I, I didn't know what to do. I didn't want to pursue a classical business career. And I was pretty good in, 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 in the creative field, but somehow not a, a valid business approach. Right. So my dad one day took me to a photo studio where he knew a guy that normally when my dad is not working as an architect or they used not to work as an architect, he used to do paintings, aquarelle, and had them <laughs> reproduced <laughs> to get the reproduction for himself. And the pictures are in the end at the basement. I don't know. It's, it's some sort of ritual to get in Oops. stress off. And one day he took me with, his, with him and uh, the photos were um, reproduced in a fashion studio. So I came in after my school, blaring music, super nice ladies everywhere, super nice um, food on the table, a really good um, studio director. It was for me another world, right? In Stuttgart, where you normally grew up with the car industry and everything that's car related, it's, it's nice, it's successful, it, but it's, it's very small or single-minded. And for mm -hmm. me, that was... London, Paris, Rome, Tokyo as a 18 year old. <laughs> so I said, I want to make an internship. That is super important if, if I can make that here. And the guy said, no, <laughs> no, we don't need that at this point. You, you, what can you do for me? Instead of putting the brakes on, he was really upfront. And uh, that set my, that sparked my interest in that. And uh, so I bought a camera, I used one shot the heck out of it, try to get these photos in front of the guy through my dad. And uh, yeah, finally, after nine months, he surrendered. And he said, okay, we can, we can try for two weeks. Yeah. And uh, from the two weeks, it was a three-year stint in the end. So it went really good. And I was his right-hand man one day. And I was a full-blown photo assistant there, helping him everywhere, doing the accounting, everything, literally. And um, by year two, um, sorry. No, yeah, I was going to ask what what the like what what was the initial subject matter for your photos? I mean, was it more portrait or? Well, in the beginning, <laughs> he said I should buy, if possible, three lenses, no zoom, mm -hmm. so that I'm really limited to three different fixed views, right? Yeah, about prime the lenses. subject, uh, prime lenses. So that's uh, I think uh, looking back was a really really good. Yeah. way of doing things and um, and then he said um, take some landscape shoot your friends do whatever you think matters 
and bring that back to me and we can evaluate if this makes sense. Um, yeah, so I shot everything around me, learned, did a lot of, you have to see that's in the analog age, right? That was in the early, mid 80s, late 80s, so yeah. eons ago. And uh, whatever I brought back, I got a critique on, which was very good, and that sharpened my senses. And then finally he said, well, I think you got a talent. And so let's see um, what we can do in this internship. So when I was in this internship, he had a vast um, collection of books, magazines, everything, print at that time, right? No Instagram, nothing. Mm -hmm. So it's just analog print and uh, when I had some time off sometimes when he was on an assignment where I was not accompanying him I looked at everything and I found the world of photography through all the books through all idols at that time and I, and I, I thought to myself man I'm getting like a clone to this guy so I'm trying to get my own thing here out and make my own mark and I want to learn more I was he was a fashion photographer very good guy but I was more into portraiture Irving Penn Richard Everton and these types at that time. Yeah. And at, at the same time, we had youth magazines, very cool club culture, which used to do cross filming. So that means you put a E6, a, a dia, a slide film into color negative chemics, which is completely the wrong way. But in the end, the photos that come from that are super high contrast and they look really cool. Wow. So the long ride went into this. Um, and maybe you can show some examples in the end in this, in this podcast. Um, the longer it went, the more I felt I have to get back to the basics and learn more about this other side apart from fashion. And um, fashion, maybe I have to approach later when I had my Lego pieces together. And I was in dire need of more Lego pieces at that time. And uh, so after year three, I finally made a clear cut. And one morning I said to him, hey, sorry, I, I have to take some studies or I have to get on a different route. And he was very disappointed, of course. But for me, it was breaking free from shackles. So um, I then studied, I, I um, made some um, different evaluations, the different um, studying options in Germany. And the best one was here in Munich. So in mm. the end, I, I made it through all the, um, how you call it? the phase when you hand all in your papers and you go through the different levels. So yeah. I made it through from, I think, 800 guys to 30. They limited down and they gave us all the time in the forefront really um, skeptical views and said, hey, are you really in for spending this and this money? And they talked to our parents and said, hey, are you in for really um, giving your guys a new camera and blah, blah, blah. So they made all these horror stories up in order for us to filter us out more and more. It was really good. Yeah. And then I studied, and that was from uh, 1990 to 93, and it was really good. So Munich has one, it's like Pasadena for car design. It's one of the good schools of thought and, and, and really fine arts where, they, where you get the right dosage of practice plus experiments plus theories in a very good way that, that sharpens your skills. Not too arty, but very good. So then this happened. And then in my last year, I already started doing uh, record covers and uh, portrait series for a wine chain. So it, it, I had to see how I finished the school. Mm -hmm. And that went very well. Yeah. So at what point did you look to, I guess, vehicle like automotive photos? Like, yeah. Where did that so, get your attention? <laughs> the, the spark, I think, was set through my dad. Okay. Architects always drive really cool even sometimes if they have no money which my dad didn't have in the beginning they drive cool rides because they yeah. can judge it by proportion by by form by surface and every, when i look back every architect i can remember had somehow something special some guys were into row row 80 mm -hmm. i have to send you that it's a it's a cult car from from the 70s, which had a drag coefficient of 0 0.3, which was legendary at the time, a Bunkle engine. So they were all into these specialized cars, right? Wow. Yeah. Row, row 80. So super sensitive car, breaks down constantly, but it's the latest cutting edge, like a Tesla nowadays. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it was set by my dad. And uh, through my studies then, I started doing, uh, as I said, record covers. That was an extension for the experimenting phase. 
I could do a lot of things and um, could work a lot in the dark room at that time, right? That was still analog printing, lit printing, Anton Corvine, all these types led by various idols. And um, when I was finished, uh, I thought either I go to schools, uh, in, to, to, to progressing schools in, in, somewhere in New York, or I go to Paris or London, but all these photographers and schools I met that they said I should, I should pursue my own career. So then I went into uh, portraiture more and more, did more and more record covers, magazines, stuff. And from then on, I went to fashion because I had then the infrastructure together for, for all the stylists, makeup artists. Then came the digital age, right, which went faster. Mm -hmm. And we had less time with all the VIPs and celebrities. In the beginning was half a day, and then two hours. In the end was 20 minutes. <laughs> Still good. And I, I, I finally shot everybody I loved so I could visit my idols. And then came the fashion era. I think for three, four years, I worked a lot for magazines and smaller clients and a lot of accessories, uh, watchmakers. And then in my, what was 2001, 2002, um, I was lucky. A car company approached me, Aston Martin, through their magazine. Mm. They had a magazine at that time. Um, uh, and there was a, the premium group from Ford at that time. If you search back, premium automotive group, PHE, that was, that was bef long before the 2008 crisis where Ford had all these super high-end brands. They had uh, Lincoln, Aston Martin, the top cars of Ford, and they were called Ford Automobile Group that was under Mr. Reitzle, which was a BMW manager at that time. And they had this magazine, which was really more like a coffee table magazine. And they somehow, I don't know, they saw my work and they thought, mm, let's get this guy and shoot a car. Nowadays, also very interesting for car manufacturers to hire fashion photographers. And uh, they gave me the old Aston Martin DB5 at that time. I'm going to send you some images. You can show them to your yeah. readers, lookers. And, um, and that went well. In the end, it was, I don't know, eight to 10 pages serious. And at the same time, um, through a friend of mine, uh, I got an inquiry from the BMW magazines. And these two magazines, they were the hardest competing magazines at that time. Now comes something on top. I had an agent at that time, and we all had these thick portfolios, still hybrid age, not fully digital, right? We didn't have any iPads or iPhones. So it was around 2002. And she had a vast selection of different artists and photographers and three car photographers. And when I was waiting in there for my appointment or when we talked and she, I had to, to wait some minutes before she was ready, I looked through all these books. And I was constantly complaining about all the car manufacturer, sorry, car photographers' books because they were super sterile, very male, mm -hmm. very static, no humor in there, and no quality, in my opinion. Because at that mm -hmm. time, what we did in fashion and portrait looked that was wallpaper magazine, like AD magazine. We did all these beautiful set buildings, so we had warmth, humanity in our frames, while the car industry was blue cold, mostly night shots, and it was for me terrible, I don't know, sterile. And I was constantly complaining. And I remember she always said, hey, don't stick your nose in there. It's a, it's a scene, and they have their workings, and they have their rules. And when I hear rules, I don't know, like a kakadu parrot, my, my normally, I, I get angry, right? Because <laughs> rules in a business which is up to date and reflects daily life like cars, you cannot come with rules only. You have to reflect something that's out there, right? So you, you can, of course, there, there's some things existing, how you shoot maybe sheet metal or whatever, but you have to implement it in the current momentum and not in a sterile environment. But I didn't know that this time, at that time, that was already a kind of dissecting ripping the things apart to this Lego in the car business. And it was mm -hmm. almost unconsciousness, unconscious how, how I did that. But I, I could just from the photographer of a fashion, I relate to these books. And for me, that wasn't cutting it. Yeah. So yeah, and then came these magazines. And um, since I had no, no clear idea how to make a light on a car, I used 10 lights. 
And mm -hmm. in the end, it looked like on a car show, the BMW. <laughs> I also sent you that image if I find it. But this somehow found resonance in the car industry to some other rights. So they thought, okay, that's interesting. I don't know why. And they hired me on the spot for a huge BMW image campaign. And I was totally overtaxed and, and, and was overwhelmed. I think I pulled it off pretty okay at that time. Not as good as I would do it today. But that was, so they, they, they threw me in the cold water. So that was my way into the whole car industry. And, wow. then, I had, and then I had to decide. Um, it was very interesting. And especially this uh, Aston Martin thing was very, very elusive and, and, and in the end ended up very nice with people with a James Bond kind of type and his lady and we made some very, very stylish shots and it was really easy for me. And I thought it was easy also with the car and the lighting. And then I found a real, it sparked my interest and I thought, okay, sh sh could be interesting because in fashion, you have to go to Paris, you have to go to London, you have to go to wherever the zeitgeist is in cars, you can turn that ship around. So if you yeah. work from Germany, you can rule all those things out. And this is getting the rule then in this business. And, um, and that worked pretty well. So I started this, tried everything I could, experimented further, uh, worked for magazines again, really low wage paid, but I could learn and perfect my craft. So uh, then I did a lot of Porsche magazine, and BMW magazine, and learned my, learned my craft. And this, uh, and I had to decide, and then I instantly cut off the, I don't know, it was dangerous. I cut off the whole fashion vibe because that interested me so much that it was like a new toy, right? And uh, yeah. I made my move. You cannot do it half-hearted, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, when you're, f like, shooting a car, what do you try to capture as far because some people will try to capture the car in sort of a lifestyle piece like okay let's plop the car into its quote-unquote natural habitat other people take a very studio approach and think let's have nothing in the background and focus entirely on the car the shape the contrast the curves the concave and convex shapes and i i don't know if there's you know, with, with art, with photography, it's hard to say, oh, this is right and wrong. It's really, what is your, what is your style? What do you like to look at? Because when I'm shooting a car, I will basically, and editing the photo and processing everything, it's, okay, what would I want to have on yeah. my wall hanging up? Yeah. Versus some other people would be like, oh, I don't like that. How do you navigate that? Well, I think your approach is probably similar to me, even though in the end our results differ a bit. But mm -hmm. Your photos are very emotional always, and you try to have the guy seeing through your eyes. So I think the moment you shoot, when you have the camera in front of you and you have this object in front of you, the camera is between you and the object, right? Mm -hmm. But the best way would be to experience this. How, how was, would this be without the lens? Is this emotional enough? Does, so you step in that moment, you, you, you go through the lens, you probably step out of your comfort zone or out of yourself, and see that from the outside, is it cool? Is it really moving you? It, because, or am I just at this point super ego in my zone and think that this is cool what I think and probably doesn't work? So I try to always, at the moment I think something is cool, analyze somehow why is this working or is it, is it a light? Or And then I push that further. So when I see something and it somehow touches me or the proportions are right, it has to be on location in my case. I rarely worked in the studio. Maybe I should do this one day and more. I did some, some assignments. And that's also good because you have nothing. You can relate to just the design of the car. So you think maybe more like a designer. In my, in my way of shooting, I would say I act more like, a, like an architect, like a fashion photographer, like someone who, who loves beauty. So that's what you end up in the end, no matter which photography field you pursue. Are you someone who brings elegance to the table or roughness? It's as simple yeah. as that in the end, right? The elegance doesn't have to do with, with commercializing. It's the way how you view things. Are they beautiful? Does it catch a nice emotion to your next man? Is it something that they can relate to? And is it something like love or something like beauty? Or do you want to push them into something harsh? shake them through or, or totally neutral maybe 
documentary, but it, there's only three fields. So when I shoot, it's probably my upbringing. It, I end up always very beautiful or very nice. I don't know what that is. Very designing, very from the tonality, from the light. So I try to push this emotion I see at that point, which has to do with the, how the light comes in, what the car does, what the car design does, or a detail from the car, if this is the eye or the mouth or the shape, the proportion. I push this further by what I find on the location. So if I was one of the first guys in the mid 2000s on a Ford, big Ford Mustang assignment who cut through the whole car with light. I can mm -hmm. also send you that image. Yeah. And I remember vastly on that production, because I look back, it was a CG shoot, how the client, so we shoot the location, we put the car in on location virtually, and then we show it to the client. And I want to see, okay, what's happening now? How, how would they react? And I saw the fear in their eye as a client that the car was slashed, but at the same time, I could relieve them and say, hey, CG, we can always push it out of the frame, out of the dark. Mm -hmm. and bring some texture to it so no worries the proportions will be good even though we slash the car in the middle but it will give you an option to focus more on the front or on the rear of the car or whatever we do with the light so it's like a detail in a full frame in a full mm -hmm. car and uh, that gives you a totally different view to the photo and and that happened quick it happened from the guts feel because that was the only chance for me to shoot this on that set because i liked it and it was like a portrait of a, of a person where you have the shadow half running through. So I just took what I had from the other field to the car industry. And that worked very well. And that's the yeah. cool thing about the car industry. And I think I'm sure you experienced that too. When you, when you bring something new to the table, the car industry is immensely thankful. It directly takes this into their DNA. And it's part of, of the language. Then, and, and that's really cool. I, I love that because yeah. people take this on and refine it. And so you leave some traces and it's part of the lingo. Yeah. And you drive a Model S from yes. Tesla, mm -hmm. which is, um, so yeah, I, want, I wanted to ask, I guess what you had before the Model S. Uh, first of all, the Model S makes sense to me because it is one of those interesting designs that was unveiled to the world 13 years ago, yet mm -hmm. still looks good. Yeah. Um, and of course, the the major the biggest change that happened was the nose cone update about five years back. But right. um, it still, as a whole, is very similar to what it was when it came out because it was designed well from the beginning. Some cars, even after a couple of years, start you start realizing this did not age well. Maybe <laughs> to a niche part of the population, it's mm -hmm. a, still interesting and beautiful in its own way, mm -hmm. and it captures that era. But what cars transcend eras like the mm -hmm. Model S? And so I'm curious, as someone who's very visually aesthetic, noticing, what did you have before the Model S? Before the Model S, I had a Volvo XC70 crossover mm -hmm. in ocean race finish. That's a mm -hmm. special lacquering with aero rims. I have to look those rims back. They were aero rims, man. <laughs> okay, here we go. Um, so, and before that, I had a van. I think hmm. Volkswagen van in black, murdered out with rims to make it look cool. But yep. um, I didn't need that at that time. <laughs> yeah, so uh, from the Volvo guy, I mean, Volvo is also good. Volvo, always they do very, very human kind of advertisement. They, and even with now the Chinese funding or partial funding, they do great work in, in, in branding their ways. They have a high level of photography. They have very bespoke color. So it it was almost like the city design car in a way, even though it was an SUV, right? Yeah. It was always a bit more, maybe that's the architect background again. It's most the pedagogic New York, whatever, what <laughs> SAP used to be, right? The yeah. Scandinavian stuff somehow translate over to the designers in a way. And even nowadays. Yeah, with Volvo especially. I mean, so what we've seen in the past, I guess, started really bigger 15 years ago and then especially 10 years and five years is the introduction of basically daytime running light leds creating a new form of face on cars mm -hmm. um because i feel like we hit kind of a lull in the early 2000s yeah. where cars started looking very boring especially yes. in the u.s they were all starting to be sore to the eye i yes. think not aging well 
Yes. And then we started seeing early forms of the LED yes. type lights, which mm -hmm. now is like a, a staple. I mean, every time a new car comes out from manufacturer, they all have the daytime running lights now in their own LED form. Some very simple, some very specific. Like I love the Volvo Thor's hammer, as they call it. Yeah. Design. Yeah. They crashed with ask... Audi, with Audi on this one, right? Audi tried <laughs> that too. And I don't know. I think they, Audi lost some cases or vice versa. Yeah, sure. Sorry. Interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What What are some of the the cars? You know, you have a Model S. Obviously, it's an easy, right. good car to own. But what mm -hmm. are some other ones that have really piqued your attention lately? Well, it started, I think, with Porsche getting their shit together finally on the on the Mission E, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. The Mission E was all of a sudden there. I knew from other colleagues of mine and from some guys at Porsche that they had from day one, 2012 on, they had three, four, five, six Model S everything reverse engineered. So they were yeah. there all the time and it was bubbling and they were somehow still unsatisfied with this situation being taken over by this lost attempt in their um, attempt to take over Volkswagen, right? It was this 180 degree turn where in the end PS took them over. So that was their way out from a design thing out of Volkswagen's corset. And uh, so Taycan definitely, Mission E even more. I think mm -hmm. they watered down the Taycan too much and made it too, too male. In mm -hmm. my opinion, Taycan was always a bit more hard and uh, Mission E was sensual, but still very good. I mean, the Taycan is 80% Mission E, but the Mission E would have been 100. Yeah. So that sparked my interest. I like very much, I'm a huge fan, and that's maybe the Model S relation here of Mazda and all their design language and all their take on things, especially maybe you can also show this to the guys and to the ladies, um, the big limo sedan concept. They did some four or five years ago, an absolute beauty, everything from the front to the side, to the back, the yeah. sedan prototype, it was impeccable. You had, we uh, had uh, parts of a stingray rear bulb lights, a very narrow rear, wonderful, simple side, a great face. Everything screams, build me, but they never build it. Um, yeah, the vision, yeah. as they yeah. call it. Yeah, yes. Wow. Look at this car. <laughs> I mean, and it's a good name because oh. it, it really does set the tone. Yes. And I think I, I was stunned when I saw this. And wow. uh, like so many other cars, though, like concept cars, yeah. when the actual car came out, it's somewhat of a disappointment, but then you have mm -hmm. to remember all the safety standards and everything they have to change True. and the manufacturing and everything. Um, True. Yeah. What you've seen so many concept cars and I've looked back on them. Um, what are some concept cars that have, that were displayed unveiled and you were so sad to see that never come to fruition? Like, well, mostly, mostly nowadays, I think with Mercedes, mm. Mercedes is a great brand. They make great products. Um, and, and, and they always try to implement the latest, what the clients want. They were very early with the EQC. Mm -hmm. But starting this electric line, they had brilliant showcases, wonderful faces. And in the end, the cars look totally different out there. And this is what Porsche didn't do, right? So this is why Porsche's success is deserved. And I don't know what's in, in, in inside Mercedes politically that crushes this vision so much that in the end they come out with something that's terrible, right? I mean, the EQS <laughs> is a wonderful car technically, drives fast, immensely mm -hmm. fast charging, uh, great consumption, brilliant. They have the best aerodynamic guy probably in the industry, apart from Tesla maybe. But in the end, the car looks bad. And then comes out an EQT. Maybe you can show this to the... To the, to the lookers mm -hmm. which is a van and which got the absolute best face now in all their electric lineup and you think god why is this face on the eqt van and not on an eqs so yeah. if you look on the screen now the eqt there's more photos there's a even simplified face with just uh -huh. a blade on the bottom if you go for picture search it's an immensely great face which would have made the EQS, with all its technical abilities, to absolute for a long time, king of the hill. So design in the end, yeah, look at this. Think about yeah. this on an EQS. 
we would have had everything. The blade, <laughs> the Japanese, Ninja Fighter, great eyes, everything is in there. Great wheels, right? Yeah. So, at, and I don't get it. I mean, maybe if they bring it out, it would be a success. But somehow inside that company, there's a political agenda which prevents them to bring out beauty. And they have taste and they have the best designers in the world, but somehow in the end, it, it crushes them inside. Yeah. And there's a meager compromise coming out. But um, yeah, same for BMW. I mean, well, yeah, I'm not a big fan of the i7 and all this new lineup. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I agree. It's, it's hard with the... I, I go back and forth on the whole kidney grill because on one hand, that is the staple of their design language, but also they made it so huge right before essentially blocking it out on their iX and i4. And then the i7 really didn't do it for me. The inside is amazing. The iX interior is one of the best of any car I've ever seen. And the exterior has grown on me, especially in the black color where it does hide the grill a bit. Um, I like the use of black and kind of gold bronze accents. Mm -hmm. um, although maybe that's somewhat my university was black and gold. So the colors <laughs> <laughs> maybe like yeah. subconscious. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it's, it's so interesting. I, you know, Kyle does not like concept cars. He wants the, the physical tangible thing in front of him, the final production unit. Fair enough. And that's valid because that is what is mm -hmm. most useful to most people. But I also love the 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 play that concept cars can have on the imagination and just the the pushing the envelope of something further for me one of the ones that i grew up loving like poster on my wall type of thing was the ford gt90 from the yes. 90s that was to me just one of the most perfect designs and very sad to see that never really come into fruition anyway of course they made the the new gt and the um the early 2000s and of course the new gt now but it doesn't um it's almost no resemblance and it I would be a collector's <laughs> item by by money and mm -hmm. by the value but never by design yes yeah. and and the old one was both i think and that's the yeah. i mean if you look if you take maybe we can also show that if you just take the front face or from a front side view a gt and a corvette in its heydays, mm -hmm. right? The Stingray, especially. Before they had the 73 Glitterado, everything around, the super bullish look. But the, the one before, you have quite some similarities. How they come from the top to the bottom of the car. So where they yeah. fuse. And that's a super hard thing to do. And you see constantly fails of this kind of thing. How does... So there are only three, four good examples, which is a Mercedes C111, right? Mm -hmm. From the 70s, the orange car, the Stingray, maybe a Ferrari 512 BBI, yeah. and maybe the Ford GT, and that's it. So these yeah. guys, they nailed this, and maybe Tesla. But a lot of cars, they don't get this front, top to the bottom, and then they fail. The, the latest Ferrari, what is the, the one that looked like a shark nose? I, I lose track of Ferrari. Yeah, me too. Yeah, exactly. They put one after the other. Anyway, I mean, everything, they have nice details. They have a brilliant technique now. The brand is better than ever, but I see too much, um, in my opinion, too much mannerism, get lost mm. in details and not ruling the whole thing. And um, yeah, the GT, the old one, was a thing of beauty, everything. And that spark, and this is the thing now, because that leads back to our early 2000s era. Mm -hmm. Porsche had the worst phase, late 80s, mid 90s, when they were almost bankrupt, right? The cars, same for a lot of US companies. It's almost like the controllers did too much. They wanted to milk the cow too much, or it was a, I don't know, from the political surrounding, it was a good phase, right? There mm -hmm. was not a, not a lot of pressure on society that could crush creativity. But still, cars were horrendously bad, except maybe one or two or three cars like a Miata at that time. Here we go, Jordan, and, yep. and some other cars. But <laughs> mostly it was shitty design. So it needs sometimes elementary crisis, especially in the design field, and then comes something new. Or yeah. an innovation like LEDs or electric now. But, I mean, then you have a, a face, even, even the, the post Countach Lamborghini area, mm -hmm. they were all dead completely yeah. right and um 
And then it comes something new and maybe it's a generation change or it needs some impetus of, of some, I don't know, film, stylish, I don't know, so, something setting the spark in all these designers and then comes a new thing. But since 2008, especially nine, which was the elementary crisis, right? That set the tone for the S, for Model yeah. S. Then came Exxon as a chemical company, developing the separator film for the battery, which was so good that finally these batteries could be used for automotive use with all the rattling and shaking and heat. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then came the big break free and, and, and Tesla and then used it to their fullest. They made a design company first after the Roadster because they learned from their mistakes and then they took it on with friends. And then Porsche came, Mazda always, and, and Franz is a, is, a, is a scholar of the Mazda era, right? Mm -hmm. He was trained, and Franz was the head of North America Mazda, and his boss at that time was the current boss uh, from Renault Design, also a very good design company. So there's a certain school of thought, which for almost like works as a catalyzator and pushing out new talents left and right. This yeah. is the main, the main thing. And Pasadena in European in, in, in your era is maybe as good, as, if not better, than what we have here in Pforzheim. Pforzheim is the equivalent to Pasadena. Mm -hmm. But I agree. I mean, early 2000s were bad. Maybe it's the millennium that shook it <laughs> apart. Or the sense-seeking. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, what, what would be... Because for you know, hundred years now, the design of the automobile has, of course, shifted so much, but still limited by the a the aspect of needing an engine, which was either in the front or middle or rear, and then designing around the engine, around the drivetrain components, around a drive shaft through the middle of the car for some cases, versus now we are entering this era of a skateboard platform, where it's essentially the battery and the motors all on the bottom, and it's almost the infinite possibilities above that and then what like what are the design trends looking forward or the limitations and is it almost like is there too much freedom now where you can just design anything and now you have to take into account more of the people like with lucid they're yeah pushing the front passengers more forward because they can because there's mm -hmm. no big engine and it, it's i don't know i don't, I don't know how they're going to start with, with some cars manufacturers i feel like they're just going to overly simplify it and if and use the same platform under every car which is okay but then how do you make it special well <laughs> if if we don't get our battery manufacturing ba this is a complicated question let, let, let me tackle this if we don't get yeah. our manufacturing capabilities back to the states we're completely dependent on china right but if we own the whole technique which will happen at one time i hope the, the battery revolution, let's call it, gives you completely freedom. So you're not limited in any case anymore. You can hide these batteries behind, under, next, left, and right. So, but this gives you the responsibility to come to the table with each single product more than before. You could hide behind technical, I don't know, bucket lists and everything. I think this is no longer possible. Now you're with the internet age and, and, and the, the vast information of info out there. You have, you have so many options to pre-filter something before you take the pencil. And this is the last step, maybe. And you cannot hide behind a lot of things. Here we are with this rules thing again, right? That someone explains to you, we have to do it like this. I sound like Sandy Munro now, but this is the point. You cannot hide anymore. And, and so that era we are now in, where we have good examples, where we have a new technique, every possibility is the brutal filter for quality. Yeah. So you cannot, so going back to Mercedes, if you have all these options, if you have the best um, aerodynamic guru, a guy who lectures leaks of future aerodynamic designers on universities and brings all that knowledge to the table. So you have all your homework when it comes to consumption and, and, and drag coefficient. If you have the best battery guys really making up for fast charging, if you have a big enough battery with a huge car, and your, your future um, halo car, then you, have to, then you have to bring it to the table and you cannot hide. Yeah. And if you do it, of course, then you failed. And then it's coming, and that's the red race. And then comes another car company, where, which um, internal corporate culture allows this. 
to break free and to go for beauty where you probably have a head who gets it, like Ford. You have a head who understands this and routes that down to his designers. And then, and then you have a beautiful flourishing era of, of probably five to 10 years until people change again. But I think that will happen definitely at Ford. It will happen at probably Neo. Neo do very good designs with a Mercedes yeah. guy. And uh, probably this Mercedes guy couldn't do it before. And now he breaks free <laughs> through China, which is a bad thing. But mm. he can do it, right? So, yeah. yeah, I think there's only one option when you have all freedoms, do your homework and not yeah. come with compromises. And the top has to somehow listen and, and, and clean that space in front of you as a designer. But it's the politics of these huge corporations in the end and the political pressure if you are in a reaction phase or if you are in a leader phase. So Tesla has much more freedom right now to do what they want. They set the pace. I mean, yeah. look at the Cybertruck, if you like it or not, they, they defined this. It's mm -hmm. nothing new. If you look back in design, they, they just made it better and more square. But, but these kind of uh, movements existed at Bertoni in the 70s and 80s. But they defined this and they were courageous and they will never go for a compromise. Even though the Model 3 might look like a compromise to a lot of eyes, it's, I think, the least compromise when it comes to minimalism, purism, mm -hmm. getting it in front of the client as pure as possible without hurting anybody so you can make the switch. And that's good. So, they, they, so this is also, in a way, a very, very clean sheet, cool, compromiseless design, even though it looks a bit normal and soft and the pe pe people don't like it sometimes. But I think it's the best they could do. And the success proves this company, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's amazing. I've, especially with the, the new Model Y, where they have simplified the engineering so much that it's, it really is the epitome of simplification. And mm -hmm. there's... It is a polarizing design in some ways. I've, I've met people who love it and hate it, um, but I think it still works. And it's almost like Tesla doesn't probably doesn't care what some people think, because no matter what you do as a company, there will be like, people against you and with you. Oh, uh, sure. Which makes it, yeah, it, it makes it impossible for the people who are obsessed with trying to please everyone. And for some companies, trying to please the majority is maybe holding them back. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. It'll be... And do you, do you know, do you have any idea how long you'll want to keep your Model S? Are you waiting for another Tesla to pique your imagination or would you jump ship? Well, if I wouldn't have our little <laughs> rim company on the side, which drains my funds constantly, but grows, yeah. um, I would probably try to get hold now pretty early of a flat or at least mm -hmm. a long range. But this is a probably two, three, four years in the future for me. Yeah. So I will continue driving this car. Charging is not as fast as the current, I don't know, Kias and everything. But we will have to see how long they hold up with all their chemistry in the batteries. But for me, I do road trips twice, three times a year with my people here, with my family. Yep. And mostly we're here in the Bavaria area. And that's more than enough. And the car still accelerates the heck out of it. It's, <laughs> it's still 2.8 with the Ludacris, which I have. Yeah, and um, it's the colors looking good. There's no more titanium within Tesla's lineup, so just sterile American colors, which is also okay from their field. But um, I think I'm gonna continue to hold it for the next two or three years, probably, yeah. and then switch over to a plaid. I think the plaid for me is a consequence because again, um, Tesla made their homework, and if I mean you see that now, and, and I think Kyle sees that. When you walk around the car, you discover more and more every day what they changed. It doesn't look like this on the first sight, but they made a ton of changes. And the car is 95% new. People <laughs> think, oh, they did just 20%. What a lazy company, and they don't get their ass up. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's the opposite. They looked at everything. They stripped on everything. The interior is completely new. The battery is completely new, also prepared for the new batteries to be yep. higher. And they made everything. They took everything apart. And then in the end, I, I can imagine only Elon thinking, fuck it, we go with this. We leave it like this. It's beautiful. And I like it. And I feel it. Yep. And that's the decision. And, then, and now they go for the Nürburgring. I think again and again. <laughs> they, yeah. they do some blood shedding in the next month. The sparring Gosh. between the Taycan and the Model S and the Nürburgring yeah. is excellent. Oh, wow. And the Stuttgart <laughs> guys will not let go. Believe me. And vice versa. 
And since Elon cannot lose, it will be the heck of an entertainment the next month. Oh yeah. And probably we will cars we will see cars flying left and right, or we will see cars literally flying yeah. with a roadster recipe. So yeah, so I I love that company. Um, not because I'm a Tesla Noid or I'm a Tesla Radi or whatever you call him, but because there was they were compromiseless in approaching what they did. And yeah. they made it beautiful. And they could have made something weird. And in the end, the first product was beautiful. And I have high respect. Under these circumstances, under this stress, if you don't even know if the real car in the long run really does the 300 miles and all these financing problems, squeeze out something beautiful. I mean, how complicated is this? And mm -hmm. the companies who have all the money in the world then came out with something but ugly. I mean, it's almost <laughs> like self-hate, right? <laughs> now coming back to your grill, to your mega grill, Yep. And coming back, that's a good that's a good turnaround. Coming back to the to the to the design needs of a electrical age. If if you have everything possible, and we said we have to nail it in each iteration you do to each kind of demoscopics you're putting it, then I think the the, the big kidneys make sense for everything M, for everything that's a raising raising hell and that's and in your face and Mustang like. I think yeah. there is cool. And the M's, the M4, M3, impeccable cars. I mean, mm -hmm. everything makes sense from the color to the rear. To it, it looks a bit boy racerish on the bottom, almost like self welded. So these yeah. cars are really, really good. But you cannot put this to the rest of the lineup if it doesn't make sense. So why go hyper aggressive in an electrical field where people already have issues in, in moving over? from the combustion world. I mean, it's, you put stick stones between the legs, design decision-wise. Why should they make the switch then? Because they want to make now a statement that they are the hardest guys in the industry. Yeah. This makes, in my opinion, psychologically no sense. You have a cool PR maybe, or the, the boss can say, hey, look, everybody's um, having now the report on us. But the normal average show and the women, you lose them all. The women, 50%, yeah. they don't even think about them. So this is the politics in these huge companies. And I think Franz and, and Mazda and Elon and maybe in Porsche also, brilliant designers, left and right, good color and trim. And you have everywhere really, really good women and they listen. They listen to these voices the same and the outcome is the wonderful car in the end. So I think wherever you have great women in charge and not Maria Barras, <laughs> yeah. and you end up with beautiful products. Yes. For me, it's as simple as that, but that's probably just my opinion. Yeah. Well, before we, we cut it short, um, I want sure. to mention the, the new era. We'll have the team on because I think there's a lot to learn, but you obviously are involved with this um, fantastic wheel company that makes wheels and to make the i think the model s look even better and of course our friend jonas has them on the model three right it's, it, it's interesting that it does work with pretty much all the teslas and that i guess mm -hmm. that stems from the design language of tesla is within a certain ethos to where mm -hmm. anything can work with any of them and so there's different approaches like our friend drew with martian wheels has a very um lightweight minimal like track focused wheel um with looking very angry and aggressive yeah and then good there's the this pack. this sleek beautiful as you call it the new arrow um and it's i mean it's it's a cool name i perhaps sometimes when like when i first googled it and i said the new arrow and it showed me the new version of the arrow wheel that tesla put out to replace their old version yeah yeah, yeah. it's like, a good <laughs> pun intended right that's what we thought yeah yeah it all worked yeah so this yeah. is always the new arrow yeah um, and it's, yeah, it's, I don't know if you want to say a little bit about it, but we'll, of course, do another episode sure. more more dedicated sure. to it. But it's, yeah, I, to give a general perspective for us, it was important that, as you said, we were talking about a name and we, we found all these nice, complicated German, whatever, worldwide working <laughs> names. And we thought about, I mean, I don't know, at one point we, we, we stumbled over a, the classical JFK speech with a new era. Mm. And I somehow, I don't know, it, it stuck in our mind that this, it sounded the same from the new era to the arrow to the arrow and then we got it we wanted yep. to build an arrow wheel that was clear but we thought the word arrow itself is i don't know 
too much sub driven and it looks a bit too pedagogic. It looks mm -hmm. like 80s and minimal ugly concepts. And we wanted to make it clearer that we can play with these words. And what we liked was the shortcut TNA. It's, uh, I think, pretty X rated in America, which mm -hmm. might be nice, right? So it's like we have in the word, in the short version, we have the, the uh, experience from the ball into the window of the cyber truck. So people think, think about this longer. TNA sets, sets, sits in their mind. And now with this West Coast Customs clip, which came out two days ago, it was brutally funny because we saw, saw exactly <laughs> what we wanted in this video and the playing with the words. And in the end, of course not, it makes sense, the new arrow, blah, blah, blah. So it gave us a good option for the search engine. It, it allowed us to stay simple and to make clear what we want. And the rest is, a lot of people don't even say, when they have a new wheel from us, the name of this wheel, which is Racer, which is not a super extraordinary name, mm -hmm. but um, they say it's the new Arrow wheel I bought. So it's cool for us, and TNA works, and we could make a good logo out of these three letters. That was also, yeah. also for us always important. Do we print three letters on a, on, a, on a cap, right? Or do we end up with something that's, that's round? That's not my cap, that's just a cap from a camera here. But yeah. I mean, it's an end, you have a circle, so do you want to go bling or do you want to go more custom made or just does it look more like a brown kind of way of simplicity? What do you want to end up on the logo, which is super yeah. important for your brand in the end? Do you want to look like everybody else out there? And then you have three letters and you maybe make a chrome and have it manufactured in China, but it's not cutting it. So we wanted to go for a, yeah, for the Tesla brown minimalist purist approach. And we were hoping that we don't have to redo the logo for quite some time. Mm -hmm. and, and that all in the end worked nicely. So we yeah. approached it from a design standpoint instead from just functional, like a bike, aero bike or yeah. like a sports brand or another wheel. We just thought beautiful design relates to people and that makes, and that proved really valuable. It works because I mean, with, with so many vehicles, especially all the new EVs, there's always this performance wheel and then there's always the aero wheel. And when you're buying an EV, typically their aero wheel is their, their standard one, their base one. It's always the ugly one. And everyone says, always skip it and go <laughs> exactly. to the next one. Yeah, so it exactly. is, it is quite the challenge. And um, it, it really is nice when it, when you breach that hump of getting it to be beautiful and functional because your wheels are both more efficient than the OEM wheels, but also have an air of beauty of course it'd be ease probably it was probably harder for you to do that because it would have oh, been yeah easy. absolutely if you had thrown away the idea of beauty you could have made something super exactly. efficient. <laughs> yeah we, it, it, this is the way to go exactly but we used deliberately the hard way because um we were thinking if we keep it simple enough and it's still cutting edge and it's still beautiful becomes a projection to each individual's needs like the cyber truck in the future in the future we will see a cyber truck <laughs> completely like a billboard from mm -hmm. every small manufacturer you can think of from from your bathroom guy to everybody they will individualize this car so if we could keep a simple wheel maybe in two or three different colors but i mean we have a disc right no matter if it's round holes or square holes in the end it's big ball of something so we got to work on the on the image of this by the logo and the rest if we fill this brand with enough emotion, that's what we do with all the photos. Photos are for us the key thing. And in our gallery, this is where everybody gets into this maze. They get in yep. there and they see one million and two productions, even more in the future. We bombard them left and right. And you, everyone who looks at this will find, I think, his own photo series, which he loves and which he then begins to fight for. And then and I just thought, what do I like about websites from products? If this product is emotional, more emotion. That's yeah. what we did. So in the end, it's it's about branding and it's about the experience. And we made a beautiful product. I hope that relates to people. That's great. Well, yeah. Before we uh, end this thing, uh, where where can people see your work? I'd like to plug whatever you think as the best. I mean, you have a website, right? Is that a good? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You can check out my website exactly ulihackman.com yeah. or de whatever. Yeah. And you can check out my works. 
Um, on Instagram, I have my archive. You can see my baby steps. Also mm -hmm. interesting, all the guys I shot, all the politicians, musicians, whatever. Yeah. And uh, I deliberately choose not to post my, my uh, commercial work there. And uh, that's where you can see my stuff. And most of it, what I'm about is also on the new arrow in a way. Even though I don't shoot a lot of um, shoots for this, I do the whole branding and I'm responsible for selecting the images and doing the CG there. So yeah. if you want, it's, it's our taste world, my two partners and me. It's, and you know, I, we hope that it relates to, to you. Great. Well, yeah, we look forward to having the whole the whole team on at some point to talk yeah. about the, era the yes. whole time because Absolutely. it's a great great yeah. case study. Um, yeah, yeah. Once again, really appreciate you coming on, and um, hopefully, everyone learns something. I always do. Every time I talk to you, I learn more than my whole university career, perhaps. Oh, <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Why that? Okay, okay, interesting. But, thanks. Yeah, yeah. So, thank you for joining, and thanks thank everyone you. for tuning thank you, in. Jordan. Yeah, greetings to Kyle and to his dad. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm kidding. We'll do. <laughs> All right. Cool.